Wow, that's destructive on a nuclear level. How delightful. You found the best place, for your vengeful needs. In this episode, Arrogant Dude poisons a struggling parent and her child on a daily basis. Until Mama Bear goes on a vengeful reconnaissance mission, and creates a Gatorade bottle of horror. Followed by a story about a Minecraft bully, who can't hide from the protective parents of his victim. Next, Troublemaker Redneck likes to pull out mailboxes, with a chain attached to his truck. But a vengeful Papa Bear creates a mailbox of doom, that sends him to federal prison. Lastly, a champion of a dad is forced to protect his daughter, from her own mother. And he does so with a heavy dose of karma. This last story is included for my loyal minions, as I left the best for last. Don't forget to greet the like button, after shunning it for two years for no apparent reason. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These family revenge stories, might be disturbing to some audiences. Many years ago, while recovering from a brutal marriage, I was a struggling single parent putting myself through grad school on a small teaching associate stipend. I was able to rent a modest apartment within walking distance of the urban campus. It was part of a series of small 100-year-old brick townhouses, which I imagine were very nice in their day. Over the years, as old buildings do, it had settled, and the doors and windows were askew enough to be drafty. In the snowy winter, we applied plenty of shrink-wrap window cling. In the summer, the brick building was like an oven, with no central air conditioning, and ventilation was necessary to stave off heat stroke. Despite the hardships, we were safe, and we were content. After a couple of years, though, this changed when a new dude moved into a nearby apartment. Because out of the scores of parking spaces behind the apartment block, he was assigned the parking space right behind mine. The guy was, apparently, an avid fan of the Fast and Furious franchise, having made various mods to his car and a vanity plate reading, Drifter. He spent all of his free time, working on this stupid car. But he had clearly neglected the car's actual engine and exhaust system. Because in order to drive the thing, he had to warm it up for 10 to 15 minutes before driving off. Every, single, time. And it wasn't a regular car exhaust, it was billowing extra rich and smelled like the gasoline wasn't fully burning off. As I mentioned in the beginning, the apartment was old and drafty. So every time he decided to drive his car, sometimes several times a day, he would first let it billow clouds of noxious exhaust fumes into nearby apartments. And right into my four-year-old's bedroom. I tried everything to keep the fumes out, but to no avail. My child and I both felt ill, every time. This was hurting my kid. I couldn't afford to move. And I was out of ideas. Seeing that he was outside working on his car again, but without giving too many details about myself, I approached the guy and explained that the fumes were filling my apartment and making me ill. And politely asked if he would mind warming up his car farther away from the surrounding apartments. He sneered at me and said, Well I'm sorry, but not all of us are lucky enough to have mommy and daddy pay for their car and put them through college. I'm sorry that my car is not up to your standards, but I'm not moving it. Shocked, I walked off in a different direction than my apartment, so he wouldn't know exactly where I lived. By the time I got home, I was angry. Fuming. I knew some sort of formal complaint would likely go nowhere. Besides, it would be truly stupid to be the only person to do so, right before whatever I was going to do next. I took some time to monitor his comings and goings and plan some proper consequences, to fix the problem myself. The goal, to end the daily poisoning of my apartment and danger to my child, permanently. Budget, shoestring, of course, because I didn't have mommy and daddy to pay for my revenge budget. Skill level, low. The problem was the engine, and I had very little knowledge about how to quickly, quietly, and permanently disable an engine. I didn't know how to jimmy a lock, or open a locked gas cap, so I wouldn't be able to get access to the engine or gas tank. And no, I was not about to Google instructions. Time available, minutes at most. The parking lot was a very busy place, as students came and went at all hours of the day and night, and sometimes just hung out there to party or set nearby dumpsters on fire. As much as I wanted to, I couldn't just douse the car in gasoline or worse, because it was parked way too close to my apartment. Cosmetic damage wouldn't work. Slashing tires or breaking windows, while satisfying, could be too loud, and not permanent. And then on reconnaissance day too, I noticed it, 
His car was old enough to have little triangle windows for venting in the back windows. And he kept them open at night. The answer, I would fight fumes with. You guessed it, fumes. The next day, I bought a cheap Gatorade squeeze bottle and some eggs. I made a yellow soup out of egg yolks and warm water to fill up the bottle about two-thirds full, then added some of the fresh dog poo that was always available next to the sidewalk outside. I screwed the cap onto the bottle and left it in the sun outside for several days, swirling it around from time to time. I waited for the early hours of a Tuesday morning, when the parking lot was the least busy, and snuck up to the car. The triangle windows were open. I popped the cap up, aimed it into the car, and sprayed days old, sun-baked rotten egg and dog poop soup, over every available surface of the inside of his car. Even down the window wells, into the air conditioner vents, and soaking into crevices and upholstery. I tossed the Gatorade bottle of horror into the dumpster, went back inside, and went to sleep. The next day was a particular warm one. It was one of the great joys of my life, to have been home that afternoon at just the right time, to be startled by a man's voice screaming, What the? What the fuck? What the fuck? I ran upstairs to the window he regularly fumigated, and through the blinds, watched the scene unfold. The dude had opened the driver's side door, and repeatedly moved his head closer to sniff and then gag. Like he refused to believe, the smell was coming from his car. He opened the other door to investigate. He kept yelling, what the fuck? And then he ran off. He came back a few minutes later wearing dishwashing gloves and carrying a stucco bucket full of sudsy water, a sponge, and a scrub brush. He spent the next half hour scream growling, holding his breath, bobbing his head into the car and scrubbing, pulling his head out to gag and scream again, and taking deep breaths to go back in. The scrubbing, retching and screaming were increasingly interspersed with pounding on the dashboard and the roof, kicking his rims, and loudly vowing revenge at the sky. Within about 30 minutes, he was surrounded by about 10 other dudes standing in a wide half circle around the car, some drinking beers, watching the show, laughing, and offering pointers. Like King of the Hill come to life. It took him roughly an hour, to realize that the battle had been lost. The dudes yelling became hoarse and whimpering. He retrieved his toolbox, removed a wrench, and started doing something new to the interior. He suddenly pulled out the entire driver's seat, walked away with it, and angrily heaved it into the dumpster. He did the same with the passenger seat. Then he took the bucket over and dumped the soapy poo soup water next to the dumpster, brought the bucket back to the car, turned it upside down, placed it where the driver's seat used to be, sat on it, and, I shit you not, drove off that way. I never saw the car again. He never drove it back. That, and his pride must have been a total loss. My greatest regret is that because smartphones didn't exist, I have no recording of that glorious day. So, my daughter, who was about 8 at the time, was really into Minecraft, as most kids are these days. Also desperately wanting to join the YouTube slash Let's Play culture, I had installed some screen recording software that would let her make videos of the games she was playing so she could later upload them to YouTube. Anyways, one day I'm minding my own business, when I hear her quietly sniffling over on the computer. I asked her what was wrong, but she didn't want to tell me so I let it go, but decided to keep an eye on her. A few minutes later I discovered what was happening, someone was harassing not only her, but also all the other kids playing on whatever server she was on. This kid, we'll call him crappy, was saying horrible things about how he was going to hurt my 8 year old daughter, she told him how old she was hoping he would stop. He told her how he was going to hack into her IP and steal all her info, swearing profusely, remember, this is a game for kids. By this time I had gotten my fiancé involved, and she was also obviously quite upset at what a little douche this kid was being. We realized that our daughter had been recording the entire incident, and a plan began to form. I started by googling Crappy's username. There were several hits immediately, the most interesting of which involved a page where he was publicly applying to be a mod for a server on Minecraft. I was able to learn a lot about this little disappointment, he claimed to be 15, likes hockey, used to live in Toronto but now lives in Florida. But the bombshell, was easily his Skype contact info, it was literally his first name with his last name. I know your name now, you little fartface. So I head over to Facebook and search for the name. Nothing. On a hunch, I searched for just the last name while narrowing my results to only the state of Florida. Several dozen hits. So I have to start combing through each one, until I find what I was looking for, a middle-aged man with the same last name, 
whose profile indicates he was born in Toronto and now lives in Florida. I found your dad, crappy. So I sent him a message on Facebook, asking if he had a son named such and such, who goes by his username on Minecraft. Dad confirmed I had the right guy. So my wife begins telling the dad everything that crappy was saying to my daughter, and we sent him the recorded video as proof. Radio silence for a few days. Then we got the message back. Crappy had his computer taken away from him for the entire summer, and had also been lying about his age, he was only 11, I think. His parents were absolutely livid with him, and he surely hated the next few months of his life. No one hurts my daughter. This happened a long time ago, but still makes me giggle to this day. So way back in the day, mid-90s or so, my family lived in a log cabin on 10 acres of land in a rural area, 10 minutes or so out of town. It wasn't totally the sticks, but you could definitely hear banjo music in the background sometimes. At the end of our nearly one quarter mile long driveway, was one of those roads that was also technically a state highway. In the am I'd trudge down to wait for the bus, when I got home I'd grab the mail and carry it back. Until one Monday morning, when I went out and noticed the mailbox was gone. On closer inspection, it looked like it had just been ripped out of the ground. Dad was obviously not pleased. He went to talk with the county sheriff who happened to live a mile down the road. Turns out, it had been happening up and down the road for months. Someone was tossing a chain over mailboxes and yanking them out with their vehicle. He suspected a guy down the road, with his great big lifted 4WD truck, but couldn't prove anything. It usually happened on Saturday and Sunday nights, with people finding out in the morning. Also seems the nicer the mailbox the bigger a target, and many had been hit multiple times. People had tried digging deeper, using more durable wood, etc. The guy just took it as a challenge and ripped them out again. His truck was a monster. Well dad said. Challenge fucking accepted. A bit about my father. He's a steel worker with an engineering background and graduate degree. Built like a bear, with forearms the size of my freaking legs. Most people looking at him, would never think this monster of a man is also brilliant, but he is. The calm, cool type that almost never loses his temper. But wrong him, and God help you. So dad goes to Lowe's and buys the fanciest, prettiest mailbox they sell. He then proceeds to install it on top of an 8 feet long cylinder of 3 inches diameter, hardened tool steel. And he wasn't done there. After digging down with post holes and dropping it in, he then filled it in with quickset concrete. To really sell it, he then used some wooden strips of half an inch, to cover the steel core of his now indestructible mailbox of doom. Primed and painted them so it looked like a standard 4 inches post. And even had my mom decorate it with flowers and such. He wanted it to be as tempting of a target as possible. Didn't even take a week. I went out for school in the morning and found the mailbox right where it should be. But attached to it, was 30 feet of chain and an entire hitch assembly. Ripped right off the truck's frame, sheared the bolts. It was marvelous to behold. Sheriff gets called over dies laughing when he sees it. He went to the house of the guy that was suspected and sure enough, he verified that the damage to his truck matched. Fun fact, destroying a mailbox is a federal crime. As in you go to federal prison, not those cushy state places. Dad was unofficially rewarded by the sheriff's department with a few cases of beer and some venison. And after that, every deputy in town would flash him a thumbs up whenever they saw him. To start off, this is a throwaway, as I don't want it to tie back to me. This is going to be a heavy one, so buckle up and you won't regret it. These events took place over several years. Let's get some backstory out of the way. So, Pepper and I had a very up and down marriage. It was one of those that I was madly in love with her, but looking back, I think she was in it more for the money and convenience. She had one son from before we got married, and I also had one son I had full custody of. Let's call her son Bernie, he was a major drug addict. While married, we had Sarah together. I toughed the marriage out for as long as I could but eventually, we just couldn't keep it together. We separated and due to traveling some for work and having custody of my son, I moved back to my hometown a few states away, so my parents could help. But I kept an apartment in the town that Pepper and Sarah lived in, so that I could still spend as much time with my daughter as I could. During this time, I asked my best friend Jason, who is a lawyer and owns his own firm, to create a child support agreement for us. It is very important to note that we only address child support, it had nothing in it about custody or visitation, or anything else like that. 
So, for about a year this was how it would work. I would spend a month with Sarah, while my parents watched my other son. After this, I would spend a month with my son. Almost exactly a year later, I could no longer afford keeping two households up and running and Pepper wanted to move back to her hometown. Her hometown was in a different state, but closer to where I lived, so I gave up the apartment and she moved. The new situation continued for a couple more years. Pepper and I remained friendly and even tried to reconcile the relationship a couple of times, but it wouldn't work out. I was still deeply in love with her, but we couldn't come to an agreement on things like where to live and such. I forced myself to try and move on and started dating. She had been dating basically from the day after I moved out. Even though I still loved her, our relationship moved more into good friends than husband and wife. So, she finally meets Steve. I never was told much about Steve, other than he was a certified ethical hacker and that is what he did for employment, this will be important later. While they were dating, she would send me texts about their dates. She even texted me the day they first had sexy time together. This hurt deeply and looking back, I think this is what she was actually aiming at, but I tried to play the part of good friend and confidant. Steve and Pepper had been dating for six months when out of the blue, she tells me they broke up and she realized that she is madly in love with me. Since it was at the beginning of summer she packed some suitcases and headed to my state. They were going to spend the summer with me, and see if they like it or not. Looking back, we had an amazing summer. All the kids are getting along, Bernie even loved it here, so we make it official that we are back together and they are moving in with me. We went and registered my daughter for school, we even were able to get her on a peewee cheerleading team for the summer. She made several friends and loved being here. There was only one problem. Pepper still had an apartment that had all her furniture and stuff in it. I offered to go up with my truck and help load everything, but she insisted that her and Bernie can get it done. So off they go to pack up and then head to their new home. As you can guess, things didn't go as planned. She was home for about three days, when she informs me that under no circumstance will she move, and I kid you not. That her and Steve are deeply in love, and are moving in with each other. To say I was destroyed was an understatement. I couldn't understand why she had done it. The worst part was that she left it to me to tell Sarah the bad news. When I told her, the devastated look on her face started turning my feelings of hurt, into feelings of anger. Then Sarah broke down, and started begging to stay with me and started spilling the beans. She told me things about how her mom would leave with Steve for days, and leave Bernie in charge. She had to learn how to cook for herself at 8, because Bernie would spend the money on narcotics and spend the whole time getting stony baloney high. If Bernie wasn't left in charge, Pepper would use her multiple convicted felon niece to watch over her. She also told me about the first time that she had met Steve. He came to their house, basically said hello and straight away disappeared into the bedroom with her mom, starting a loud sexy time session for everyone to hear. Sarah was outside the door bawling her eyes out, and they just ignored her and continued. This is how my 8 year learned of sexy time, and she is still in counseling trying to recover 7 years later. At this point, my anger has turned to rage. I immediately notified Pepper, that there was no way Sarah was coming back and I would fight her to the death to keep her out of that situation. Pepper responded by getting an emergency hearing in her state to force Sarah back. I had to scramble, but I managed to get a lawyer and easily won the hearing, which Pepper showed up late for and told the judge it was due to a disability. The judge agreed that since there was no custody agreement, and with the troubling accusations that I had gathered, it was best for Sarah to stay with me for the time being. I had won the first battle, but it was short-lived. Within an hour of the hearing, I started getting tons of phishing emails and texts, I was also getting password resets and MFA codes from my bank, Facebook, Reddit, and many other accounts. I knew that Steve was behind it. The very next day Jason calls. His law firm's website, email, and phone account had been hacked. Because he had to disclose the hack to the court and because he was working on a semi-high profile case at the time, the FBI got involved. To say I was enraged was an understatement, these two people had destroyed me, harmed my daughter, and tarnished the reputation of my lifelong friend. It was time for them to pay, and pay dearly. I was a man on a mission. I spent hours digging up as much dirt as I could on Stephen and Pepper. I had a lot of luck with Pepper. I found social media posts of her out late drinking, that correlated to tardiness and missed days at school for Sarah. I found tons of pics of her and two strange kids doing questionable activities. I found neighbors that were willing to testify that Sarah had to come beg for food, because she was left with either Bernie or the felon. I knew I had enough to bury her, in the filth of her own creation.
Steve on the other, had all his accounts locked down. I couldn't find any dirt and it was driving me crazy. Then it hit me to try LinkedIn. And it paid off. There wasn't much posted, but through his account I found Maria, his ex-wife's account. I reached out to her and she happily accepted. Maria and I became fast friends. She felt pure hatred towards Pepper, for good reason as they had both abandoned her kids like my daughter, and didn't want her around her kids. I learned so much. To keep it short, Maria and Steve had recently divorced. As part of the custody agreement Steve got the house, car, bank account, savings, and a lower than usual child support. Maria had traded all that money and assets to have control of the kids. She knew he was a scumbag, and all she was concerned about was keeping her kids safe. They had a very detailed custody agreement with rules for Steve to follow. As part of that agreement, if Steve broke any rules, then he had to pay and pay dearly. He had to sell the house and give her half of everything. His child support would also double, and Steve would be financially ruined. Steve also didn't have her blocked on social media and would regularly send texts, bragging about how great his life was without her. Many of those texts had pictures of Pepper in them. We compared notes, we swapped evidence, we came up with a plan. And now it is time for revenge. First, I got with Jason, he let the FBI investigator know that I had also had some hacking attempts aimed towards me, and we believed it was the same person. The investigator called quickly. I gave him all the information I had and who I believed was doing it, but then he asked a weird question. He asked if I knew where Steve worked. Well yes I did, thanks to Maria. So apparently, Steve wasn't as good as a hacker as he thought himself to be. They had already traced back the hack on Jason to a business. The very same business Steve worked for. As soon as my conversation with the FBI was done, I called his work to lodge a complaint. I told the manager that someone was trying to hack me, and I was sure it was Steve. They of course didn't take it too seriously, because I had no proof. What they didn't know, was that they were soon going to be getting a visit from a special agent. The next week was absolute hell for Steve and Pepper. Pepper got served with the divorce papers, and her lawyer got served with all the evidence I had gathered. My lawyer said it was the most complete investigation he had ever seen. I had all 40 tardiness and 19 absences tied to nights out drinking with Steve. I had hard proof of them abandoning my daughter for days at a time. As a cherry on top, Maria even gave me a picture that was taken at 2 a.m., the night before the emergency hearing, in which you could see Steve and Pepper drinking in a tattoo parlor. The same hearing, she was late to and said it was due to a disability. Steve got served that he had violated the entire custody agreement. Maria had pictures from me, proving he was with Pepper on nights the kids were with him, and they were left alone. She also had proof that there was contact with Pepper that violated the custody agreement. The fallout was awesome to watch. Steve was fired, between my complaint, another older complaint of him hacking, and the FBI showing up, they had no choice but to fire him. He did avoid any legal issues as the FBI could never tie it directly to him. The word spread of why he was fired, and no one would hire him in an IT job again. He had to sell the house, liquidate all the investments, and bank accounts and give half to Maria. His child support got to stay the same, since he no longer had a source of income. Last I heard he was working at a grocery store. So in total, his income went from 200k plus a year, to less than 40k. As for Pepper, the divorce was swift and painful for her. The judge ruled in my favor for all counts. I got sole custody and sole decision making. She was forced to go to counseling, and she and Bernie can only visit Sarah with a third party supervisor, paid for by Pepper. Several times she would call and beg for forgiveness, or for me to agree to lift the supervision order. I stayed the course and denied her requests. It has been over a year since either I or Sarah have heard anything from her. Sarah is doing much better. She still needs counseling, but she thrives in school and has many friends. She very rarely sees her mom, but she is much better off without her. You stay till the end, which means you're the one I make these episodes for. I want to take this moment to thank you. I really appreciate you because you bring me a great amount of joy. Subscribe for future uploads and show your vengeful devotion by tickling the like button without mercy. Do you have any experiences surrounding the topic of this episode? Share yours below. I'll join the conversation and I'll be seeing you in the next one.